Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Small Screen Maniac. I'm your host, Constance Miller. I wasn't able to do a spoiler review for episode 10, uh, so I'm going to kind of throw that in with this overview of the entire first season of X-Men 97. So if you don't want to be spoiled, please go watch the show, come back and watch this video and share your thoughts in the comments below. Let me know what you think and if I'm spot on with my review of each and every character in random order. There's 21 characters to cover, so this is going to take a little time. Grab a snack. The first character we're going to take a look at is Executioner. And he is voiced by Lawrence Bain, who originally voiced Cable in the X-Men animated series. Pretty interesting. I had a feeling he was going to be a one-off villain, but he certainly made his mark as he was the one who stripped Storm of her powers when he was actually aiming for Magneto. Next, there is Mr. Sinister. And he is once again voiced by Chris Britton, who returned to reprise his role as the villain that I love most of all in X-Men lore. And he did not disappoint. In fact, this show did not disappoint until the very end, as far as relating to Sinister. It was super awesome to see him go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jean Grey. That was really awesome, especially as he melted in the shadows and reappeared. That was great. The ultimate uh, defeat of Sinister by Phoenix yay, uh, led to uh, his depletion of uh, DNA that has kept him alive for many, 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 many years. Now we're going to talk about Jubilee. Jubilee is voiced by Holly Cho this time around instead of Allison Court. However, Allison does make an appearance as an older version of Jubilee in the Motendo Life Death Part 1 episode. And Jubilee's story arc was rather interesting. She played a mentor to Roberto. And she also got to turn 18. And she also got a new costume. So that was pretty cool. Other than that, there really wasn't much going on with Jubilee. Rogue is up next. And what a delight this is. Lenore Zahn returns to voice Rogue as she did in the original X-Men animated series. And Rogue did not disappoint in this series. She made some bold choices had a great arc and kind of made me a little bit more of a fan of a character. I've always liked Rogue, but I've never just really loved Rogue, and this show has made me love Rogue. I honestly have to hand it to Ray Chase, who voices Cyclops, taking over the role from the late Norm Spencer, and it's seamless. You would think it was the same actor. And that happens to be the case with another voice actor that we'll talk about a little bit later, I'm sure. So Cyclops had a brilliant story arc in this series, and it also spotlighted what a badass he can be. And using his optic blast in ways that we've never seen before in the animated series, and also giving him moral dilemmas that actually really personifies the character of Cyclops. That was great to behold. I loved it. 
Up next, we have Bishop, voiced by Isaac Robinson Smith. And Bishop really didn't have a lot to do in this uh, first season. I expect more out of him in the next season. However, the moments that he had to shine, oh, did he shine. And it was gorgeous. The use of his powers, the way his veins lit up in his arms. Yeah, yeah, this was the Bishop that we know and love from the comics. My girl, Jean Grey, is next. And she is voiced by Jennifer Hale, who takes over the role from Catherine Disher. And Catherine does return, so we'll talk about Catherine in a little bit. Jean Grey got an amazing upgrade in this season, and it was so awesome to see her use her powers without fainting. That was great. And to show what a powerful mutant she actually is, especially with her telekinesis. That was refreshing, and the little glimpse of Phoenix that we got in the last episode was just astounding. I was so geeked, and it um, really makes me want more. More Phoenix, even though she said the Phoenix Force has left. Oh, it was just gorgeous. George Busa returns as Beast, and oh, how remarkable it was to hear his voice doing this character again. It was like no time had passed, and that's actually the way with all the returning voices uh, that reprised their original characters. And Beast wasn't really given a lot to do, but he had some really good lines. He was written extremely well, and which I feel did justice to the character. And I hope we get to see more of him going into battle like we did this season. And uh, yes, more Beast, please. I, I actually like, I like spoilers. Don't get me wrong. But I really avoided spoilers for the series because I wanted to be surprised. I wanted to figure things out. And I did figure out that Bastion was going to be the big bad of this season. And I was elated when I was right. It was great. Oh, and the fact that he is voiced by Theo James is just mind-blowing and he did such a good job with this character bringing him to life he hasn't been a part of any x-men media before this so this is our first chance to see bastion in actual action and it did not disappoint and while i feel that he could have been a bit of a bigger threat than what he was he was still pretty awesome as the big bad, so kudos Theo James, good job on that. That Banff sequence was glorious, it was beyond words, and to have Nightcrawler and the original voice Adrian Huff back was such a great touch and aside the Banff, seeing him wield three swords, one with using his tail, how could you not love that? And it was really nice that even though my spirituality isn't in the Christian faith, I'd still respect it. And to see how deep that Nightcrawler is in his faith and how that was portrayed was really amazing and I hope we get lots more of Nightcrawler in season two because this show needs it 
and not because of in a in a bad way. This show needs Nightcrawler. Just period. Oh well, Gambit. How wonderful and moving his arc is in this season. AJ Lacasio took over the role from Chris Potter, even though Chris Potter returns. And that was another seamless performance. Like, had you told me that Chris Potter was still doing the voice gambit, I would have said, yeah, I could tell. But it wasn't. And that was great. And As with most other characters, you got to see Gambit in action in ways that you haven't seen except for in the comics. And that was glorious. I'm using that word a lot. <laughs> My adjective vocabulary is really stumbling right now, but this is what happens when you don't script things. Um, and of course, we have to talk about his death scene and how touching that was, how surprising it was. I remember gasping when he got stabbed in the side. And I thought for sure that he would survive, but he lit up that Mega Sentinel or whatever they're calling it and allowed it to explode with him in the blast. And, oh, not since Jean Grey and her sacrifices in the comics have I felt such pain and grief and surprise and awe at the fact that this show went there. This show went there. Now rumor has it he might come back. Depending on what happens with Apocalypse. I really, really, aside the fact that I want AJ Locasio to still have work, <laughs> I, I want Gambit's death to resonate permanently. And if they retract that, it's going to lose its meaning. But the X-Men always come back. They always do. Jean Grey's not the only one who's been resurrected many times, so... I guess we're going to look forward to Gambit some more. Aurora Monroe. Oh my gosh. I loved this interpretation of Storm. It was exactly where she needed to be, although I feel she was sidelined quite a bit. But the moments that she got were... And Allison Seely Smith returns as the voice of Storm. She was not the original voice of Storm. Ione Morris was. But Allison eventually took over. And then we dubbed some of the earlier episodes of X-Men the Animated Series. Even though I, I think on the DVDs and maybe on Disney Plus, the original voice actors, Ione Morris, is still the voice of Storm. Um, I have a little bit of an issue with 
the overdramaticness of how Storm is portrayed in the voice acting. But I also know that Storm has to suppress her emotions as much as possible so the weather doesn't go out of control. And to that degree, Allison is brilliant. Because when she is overdramatic, that is when chaos erupts in the skies. And it's a great touch. It really is. And I appreciate that so much more now with this series than I did before with the original animated series. We finally get some definition to Cable. And Cable is now being voiced by Chris Potter, who previously voiced Gambit in the original animated series. And, well, he's not Lawrence Bain. Cable wasn't really all that developed in the animated series to begin with, and now we get a little bit of depth. And we get some characterization involved with Cable. And it's complicated. It's horribly complicated, but it's going to get flushed out in Season 2. Uh, I am so excited that they're taking on that storyline. The Adventures of Cyclops and Phoenix. Well, except it will be Cyclops and Jean Grey. As, unless she decides she wants to go by Phoenix, even if she doesn't have the Phoenix Force anymore. But this isn't about Jean, it's about Cable. And and the touch that they added to when Madeline sent Nathan off into the future with Bishop, that bound him to her for his entire life. So much so that he eventually regrets, not regrets, sorry, that was the wrong term, resents Jean Grey because she's not his technical mother, even though genetically that is the case. But we're going to get into Madeline a little bit later. I had a little bit of a problem with Valerie Cooper, Dr. Valerie Cooper. I think that she fell into the trap that some of the X-Men movies fell into where they put in characters that were good by name. Not good as in good versus evil, but good by name. But they didn't follow the same trajectory of the character in the comics. I felt a little bit of that with Valerie Cooper. And kudos to Catherine Disher, who originally did the voice of Jean Grey. She came back and did the voice of Val Cooper and was very effective. But I Aside my qualms with that, I think that she was also... That happens a lot from the neighboring apartment community. I'm going to let this ride. Because it pisses me off. Thank you. So back to my train of thought. I feel that Val was underdeveloped. She had a great monologue toward the end. 
that I thought was very fitting. But you could have thrown any character in there. In fact, you could have created a new character that didn't even exist in the comics. And that would have been fine. So to use Val Cooper in that spot, I feel is... A little bit of a detriment to the character that I knew from the comics and yeah that's where I stand on that. Lilandra, oh Charles Xavier's love, um, I found her to be a toxic bitch. And I know that this is supposed to be one of the great literal star-crossed lover storylines for the X-Men. And I, I just, yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't like this. And... I necessarily don't remember Lalandra being so, so toxic in the comics, but maybe she was, and I just didn't realize it because I was much younger at the time. So yeah, maybe this sheds new light on the character of Lalandra, and maybe I shouldn't really be on her side. Guy Augustini voices Roberto, um, also known as Sunspot, and it was a very interesting choice to include Sunspot in the series as the point of view character that Jubilee was in the original, and the fact that Jubilee basically gets to mentor him uh, is, is pretty decent. I, I was not enthused or enthralled by the storyline. I think it, it hammers home the ideals of the X-Men, what they stand for, what they're fighting against. I, I felt that, but maybe because I've been a fan for so long that I already know that. Um, so that's why he's a point of view character, is to throw out those ideals. And so I hope that even though he had a really good plot twist, during the last three episodes. I hope they do more with him in season two, where he comes into his own. Sort of like Jubilee did this season. Oh, Madeline Pryor. Oh. How I wish they took their time with this storyline. I see why that's it happened the way that it did, but this was such a pivotal storyline in the comics and for a show that has done so well previously with adapting actual comic storylines in short format, this was too short. This shouldn't have been a one episode thing where Madeline becomes the Goblin Queen and then suddenly she's re rehabilitated and she's a member of the Genosian Council and then ultimately dies. I, I, I think that Madeline deserved a bit more respect than what she was given. And I'm not really a fan of Madeline Pryor. Honestly, because I love Jean so much. 
I, I honestly, and it's just like, I kind of resent Phoenix in a way because she took over for Jean, but I love my Jean. Jean as Jean. And if she's got the Phoenix Force, that's fine. As long as she's not being replaced or cloned, I'm, I'm all for Jean Grey. Initially, Forge was a character in the original series that was in the future, where Bishop uh, came from. And there was also his version in the present time, where he was a part of X Factor that was briefly introduced in one episode. And in that episode, no mention of his ties to Charles Xavier at all, period. So when he was introduced into X-Men 97 and said that he was a longtime friend of Charles Xavier's, uh, that, and if I'm wrong, please let me know. That was a bit contrived for me. Uh, Gil Birmingham um, does the voice of Forge. And there were moments where I really felt that it was the same voice actor from the original series. But it's not. But once again, a good seamless performance and we're gonna see more of Forge and I hope against hope that they develop the love relationship with Forge and Storm a little bit more before that gets decimated by well it was Mystique in the comics, but, um, <laughs> we'll have to see what happens. Uh, so yeah, so, it, it, it was also really, really, really awesome to see him wield his magic. That was something I mentioned in a video previously that I forgot that he could do. And so that kind of Doctor Strange, like, circle around the wrist and arm kind of thing was really awesome to see. I and mean, I was just like, okay, all right, I see you. I got you. Good for you, Forge. Good for you, Forge. The depiction of Magneto in the series was so inspiring and heartfelt and gut-wrenching and powerful in so many ways. And Matthew Watterson is the voice of Magneto in the series and he does tend to capture a little bit of the original voice actor in his performance, not dead on like Rage Hayes or AJ Ocasio, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I appreciated the nod for what it is, and wow. You would think that with the X-Men movies over the years, it's been 20 some odd years, that you think that you couldn't learn anything more about Magneto. And it turns out you can. And this show delivered it. It was brilliant. It's really weird that Magneto and Professor X ended up being toward the end of this sort of random review of the show. Uh, 
as they have been feature, excuse me, feature spotlights in every medium that the X-Men have explored. It was great to see Xavier in a teacher role instead of just a leader of a band of superheroes that are feared by humanity. And upon his return, I love that they didn't shy away from the controversy of the fact that everybody thought he was dead. And now he just shows up and expects to take back over. But at that moment, there was no time to quabble. It just like everybody had to fall into place in regard to what they were used to doing years and years ago and that leaves a lot of unresolved issues handled very well very well I loved it I love it it was great oh <laughs> let's get woke people um, <laughs> Morph. Oh my gosh. J.P. Karliak is new to the voice role. And... There is so much, like, outside commentary that I could talk about with this that I'm not going to discuss because I've already discussed it in a previous video uh, versus another YouTuber. Um, that I'm not going to call, call to. But the fact that everybody was in a tizzy about Morph being non-binary. You didn't have to worry about that. The only sign of that was in the end credits. And... The buddy relationship with Wolverine is just that. It's a buddy. Not a budding. A buddy relationship and that has been established since the original animated series that hasn't changed so many people read into so much and as much as I would love some more LGBTQIA representation in media. This isn't with Morph. It's just not. So tell me what you think in the comments below. I'm really interested to hear what people who have watched this season and haven't witnessed the original series at all have to say. And also, I want to hear from people who watch the original series when it aired or before X-Men 97 came out and 
and have to say about it as well. It's a great topic of discussion. It's going to be beautiful. I just want to hear it. I, I want to hear all the good stuff. So thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe. And hit that notification bell if you want to be notified whenever Renson Productions uploads the video. And as always, love and light to you all. See how I threw that in there? It's on purpose. It always has been on purpose.